Well, welcome to Transparency with Zeb King. Uh, today we have a guest on the show, Marianne Neal. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Zeb. Uh, it's, it's an honor to have you here. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll get to know a little bit about you and also about uh, some of the, the books that you've brought and, and particularly one that you are, you've been working on for some time now. Uh, well, I'm very happy to be here. Thank great. you for inviting me. Uh, and you live in Central Saanich, is that correct? We do. Yeah, not yes. far, I believe. So, um, and uh, have you lived here very long in the community? Or? We've only been in Central Saanich for a year and a half. Uh, prior to that, we were in Broadmead, and before that, in Gordon Head. Right, and and then um, probably getting to uh, what we were talking about in terms of um, the the book that you've been working on. Um, wh what is this? The name of the book? Uh, Denny Heroes of the Satu. So Denny Heroes of the Satu. Yeah. Okay. And um, who are the the Dene? Uh, the Dene Nation, I think, is quite extensive, and I don't know all the different Dene people, but I know the the Dene people in the Satu, which is a region of the Northwest Territories, mm -hmm. with five very small communities. So you wrote this book, did you? No, no, I did okay. not write this book. <laughs> no, this is, I'm the editor. Okay. So, um, no, right. this book was written, it's a collaborative effort between um, the school and the community, but it is community driven. So the Dene leaders invited me to their community to, they weren't too sure what, they just said, we need your help, Marianne. And I said, well, how about a writing project? Because they said that the young people need to improve their literacy skills, reading and writing. They also said that the young people need to take pride in their Dene heritage. So I said, well, I invited the young people to think of someone that they admire, mm -hmm. who's of Dene descent. Justin Trudeau does not qualify. <laughs> so that would be, and it could be someone from the past, the present, or the future. And then write about that person. Maybe interview that person, maybe not, mm -hmm. but write about that person. And then I said, we would publish those stories into a book. This is the book that uh, arose as a result of that collaboration. Some of the young people drew pictures, mm -hmm. some of them took photographs, and but most of them wrote about someone that they admire, their Dene hero. And it will become a living history because this is volume one, as you can see. Uh, we're already working on volume two which will come out next January. This was in January uh, of 2017. Next year, January 2018, we'll have volume two. And eventually, I hope that every home in the Satu will have a library of heroes. This is interesting. Uh, yeah, a whole bunch of questions come to mind, um, but one of the key ones that I wanted to ask you uh, is um, how, how do you address the perception perhaps, um, um, which may not even come from the community there, but of of an outsider or a, a, a non-Indigenous uh, person coming to the community, this, uh, what what I think some Indigenous community sense is uh, the outside saviour coming in. So d mm -hmm. do you have that uh, become an issue or no, a question? No, or? it's never been an issue no. because I feel like part of their communities and mm. they've accepted me as part of their communities. Um, the word Dene means people and they believe that everyone is Dene. So you're Dene. <laughs> they are, these are the Dene people of the Satu. But I'm Dene too, even though I'm a Mula, a white person. I'm still part of the human race. So they're kind of colorblind that way. They don't see people in different races as being superior or inferior or outsiders or insiders. <coughs> they, I think the Dene people look into your heart and if they see that your heart is good, you're accepted. Having said that, my roots with them go back to 1971. When I went and visited, I was only 19 years old and I wanted to visit an Indigenous community 
that was living a traditional lifestyle, and that was Colville Lake, the most remote place in North America, mm. accessible only by dog team in the winter and float plane in the summer. So I visited them and I got to know the people and basically they welcomed me with open arms and they said, you have a good heart, you have a big heart. And I guess I do. I just wanted to get to know them and see what, where I fit into their world view. And now I've come back and I've said, how can I help you? And they said, yes, you can help. Because now that I have a background in education and leadership, they said that's what we need to step into the modern world. So um, the way you've presented it, being that everybody is, uh, as you said, Dene, uh, to this, these people, uh, have they had any occurrences where, where it hasn't gone well with uh, outsiders coming into the community? Or is it uh, oh. the case that everything's gone no, well? No, no, the whole history of colonialism, it's alive and well, and, uh, and it's not pleasant. I mm -hmm. mean, this is something that every Indigenous person in Canada has, uh, has to struggle with, mm -hmm. and that is this history of uh, colonialism. And I don't need to get into it with you, I'm sure, but there's just been so much um, mm -hmm. abuse and racism. Um, I think personally that the Indigenous people have been more than patient and more than tolerant with the colonizers. Um, the people that I'm working with just want to move ahead and they want to get on with their lives, and they want to be self-governing. They're incredibly smart. They are hardworking. Uh, they're very talented, strong, resilient, spiritual, lovely people. And they, they just want to get on with living their lives and being contributing members of the community. And so I imagine you stayed in touch with them for some time and then, as you said, they got in touch with you and asked you to uh, assist them, is that correct? Uh, well, I, yeah, I just happened to be in Yellowknife and happened, they okay. happened to be, the Satu Secretariat happened to be having a meeting and they happened to invite me and I just told them what I was doing and they said, oh, yes, yes, we've heard about you. We, we know who you are from our parents and aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas. We know who you are. Mm -hmm. And um, so then they said, when can you come back? Can you, they want to know about distance learning because the distances are incredible in the Satu. Large, large distances and accessible still to this day accessible only by airplane. Um, there's an ice road in the winter, but it's only open for a short period of time and not reliable and dangerous. So basically you're settled with, you're saddled with taking airplanes that are very expensive uh, back and forth. And the schools are small. The communities are very small, so the schools well, are small. What size would they? Mm, population ish. 150, 150 people. 250, 400, yeah. you know, 800. And, and numerous small communities. Five are, small communities okay, in the Sotu. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think distance learning is going to be mm. really big for them, and mm -hmm. I would like to be able to help them set up the technology and have uh, self directed, mm. technology enhanced learning. And that's your training, is it, in education? That's a large part of what I do, uh, right. teaching at Royal Roads University. And I teach in a number of different areas, including educational leadership and um, curriculum instruction and assessment. Mm -hmm. Also uh, global studies and many, many different areas. And at Royal Roads, every course is augmented with a website. And so it's kind of, it becomes logical after a while to use technology to enhance learning. And that's going to become something I think that will be accepted more and more into schools, but particularly these remote northern communities where they don't have access to the same kinds of resources that we have down here. So, so I think we, we addressed this. It, it's safe to say that you were not entirely an outsider. 
<laughs> Not entirely. No. Right. no. Um, you had this uh, history and connection. You, you mentioned your family connection to the area, correct? Yes, yeah. yes. And just knowing the people up there and having tea with them, getting, I think, getting to know them. I think that's the the key to trust and understanding. Uh, I got to learn some of the language. Hmm. And what is the name of the language? Is it Denny, uh, they is call it? it's called Slavey, North Slavey, oh, but they. I don't want to use that term. Mm. Uh, we want to call it the Dene language mm. because um, it's not a, it, again, it's a colonial term. Mm. Slavery is a colonial it's term. It's a reference to slavery? And it slavery. is. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. didn't know even the, the lake, I guess, great slavery, et cetera. It is, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. So uh, a lot of these things are changing, and I think they need to continue to change. The Dene language is a really interesting language, and it's spoken different ways in different communities. Um, they can kind of understand each other a little bit. I think that preservation of the language is a really big thing that we should be working on. Yeah. And um, so wow. language preservation and revitalization, um, building leadership capacity in young people, mm -hmm. um, critical thinking skills, literacy. These are all skills and competencies that are greatly needed. I would imagine there's quite a challenge with, um, with pop culture, et cetera. People would have television, Twitter, all the other things that we have today, drawing folks to the um, I, I various personalities that tend to live in urban areas and, and culture from urban areas coming into their homes, et cetera. So uh, is, does that speak a little bit to the idea of heroes that are at home versus heroes home here, at a home distance? Homegrown heroes, right. that's right. Because uh, we see, you know, if you go into the grocery store, you're going to see a lot of so what we call celebrities, right. movie stars or sports heroes, athletes, those kinds of people, uh, which don't have much to do with the hunting and trapping mm -hmm. and fishing and living off the land lifestyle of the Denny people. Yet, I think that the Denny people have survived for probably 10,000 years, 8,000 anyway, in the harshest climate on the planet. I think they're heroes. They, <laughs> they provided food and medicine and transportation to all those early Europeans who came here. They helped the fur traders. They, they've done amazing things to, to help the, the Europeans who colonize Canada. I don't think they get enough credit for that. I don't see I don't see their names in the history books occasionally, but no I don't mm, actually. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know that make I, I agree with you. Uh, in terms of the heroes that we talk about, the historical heroes, the explorers, the um, essentially the those who are part of the colonialization of of this area. Um, well, we hear for, of them. for example, the Mackenzie River is huge. It's one of the largest watersheds in the world. I think I think second only to the Mississippi and the Nile, or maybe maybe third somewhere around yeah. in there. Oh, well, why is it called the Mackenzie River? Right. Uh, Mackenzie was this little guy who came over, and the the native people, the the Dene people, are the ones who showed him around and hmm. took him down Decho which is the name of the river. So I don't know why it's so, not called so that joke. Why isn't it? Because Does somebody it? wrote the word Mackenzie on a map in the 1700s and it's stuck. Yeah. Is, I, I think some t you hear a little bit of that changing here and there, very small uh, change, I, I suppose. But some changes to names. But uh, overall, the, the entire map of Canada is... is is uh, named by uh, non-indigenous people uh, after various explorers and others, but yeah. it is changing. Yeah, yeah. Arctic Red River is now known as Sikachik. Okay. Uh, Fort Franklin is now known as the Delaney. Fort Norman is known as Tulida. What do we say to the people who are afraid of the loss of the even the colonial history? I mean, uh, these forts, etc. Do they have any um, 
uh, grounds for being concerned about the, the, those names also disappearing, or should, is there a way to have to, to have record of that of that name as well? Well, it, that's a, it's a very good point, uh, but I'll give you the example of Delaney. Uh -huh. Uh, Delaney was known as Delaney for about 8,000 years. <laughs> it's right. just the place where the rapids are. Okay. On Great Bear Lake, it's the only community that is on the shores of Great Bear Lake. And it's right where the Bear River flows out of Great Bear Lake and flows down to the Mackenzie River. So it's a gathering place that was a community for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Sir so John Franklin came along with his men and needed a place to overwinter and lived there for two years. And that's where he saw the Danny people playing hockey on the ice. They were just playing with a stick and some rocks on the ice of Great Bear Lake. So we say that's the birthplace of hockey. That's great. While he was there, the people were not very happy with Sir John Franklin and his men because they were all men. They had not brought any women with them, so they were quite interested in the Denny women, even when mm. they were married. So the Denny people were actually quite afraid of Sir John Franklin. They, they helped him. They gave him food, they gave him shelter, and they, they you know, worked as best they could with the, with the men. And then when they found out that their place was going to be known, was not, not known as Delaney anymore. It was going to be known as Fort Franklin. They said, well, that, that's odd. Oh, oh well, we, we live here. We know it's Delaney. <laughs> but then after a while, the post's office came along, and they, if they wanted to get a letter, they had to ask people to address it to Fort Franklin. Mm -hmm. And after, I think it was about 150 years later, they started to think, Oh, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. Um, yes, Sir John Franklin, he probably did some great things for Canada, but this is our home. All the people who live there, their ancestors have lived there for many thousands of years and called it Delaney. So the loss of a name that was there for 150 years, I think is quite trivial in comparison to regaining a name that was there for thousands of years. Mm. That's just my personal yeah. perspective. I don't know what I, I think. I think I don't know whether they would agree with me, but I think that they do because it took them a few about ten years of writing laboriously back and forth to the federal government to, to have their name changed back. Not easy for them. Yeah. No. Right. No. Not uh, easy. And is the education system they're run by? The Dene, or is it? No, they're no. looking to take over control. Once the once each community becomes self-governing, they will have control over their own health care, education, everything. Mm -hmm. Their bylaws, their um, corrections, everything. That another process that's been taking a long time? It's another process that's been taking many years and is not completed mm -hmm. yet. But they're working towards, it's a goal, they would like to be self-governing. And when that happens, they will have control over their own education system. They would like to have their own curriculum. They would like to have their own teachers and learn in the ways that are best for them. And Fascinating, as you say, for 8,000 or whatever number of years they were self-governing. Exactly. Uh, and such a struggle only fairly recently to try to become self-governing again under this new... Yes. Uh, somewhat new um, reality. Yeah. <laughs> I say new, yet we're talking thousands of years. <laughs> but yeah, right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, that's fascinating. So then you've, you've written the book. Can, what can you tell us about the book? Um, well, the book was, um, the goal was for the young people to have a purpose for, for their writing, not just to learn how to write a sentence, but actually to have a purpose and to see their names in print. So you can see that um, each person who contributed to the book has their name in there and then they also have, we've written a little bit about them mm. and then their hero. And So you, you've written a little bit uh, or, or who wrote the... Uh, well, I got, no, they did, they, they did. did most of the writing, yeah, 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 some of it 
they were speaking to me and I was scribing it for them, for them yeah. but I didn't want to put words into someone's mouth and so I would double check you know is this what you what you mean is this what you want to yeah. say and uh, they did great they did great and people said to me did you write this or did the students themselves write this and I said no the young people wrote it they are capable mm -hmm. and I think that giving them that sense of pride giving them uh, that sense of accomplishment and really getting them to examine who is your hero? Who do you admire and why? Yeah, and so for viewers, what are some examples of their heroes? I mean, first I should ask, is the book for sale for, for viewers? What would they... No, the book is not for sale. Oh, okay. It's very personal sure. and it is written by the community, about the community, for the community. So although, although we have sold some, some of these books in order to raise funds for next year's mm. volume, um, and we have it catalogued in the Library of Canada, and we also have um, the series. Is, so, so it will continue over the next 20 to 40 to 50 years, I hope. Um, I don't know if it will ever be for sale in a bookstore mm -hmm. because the purpose is that the families in the Satu will have something that they can, they can hold up as pride, uh, that they're proud of. Mm -hmm. And that they can look back 20 years from now and say, oh, look, when you were in grade nine, you wrote this. Oh, look, when you were 18, you wrote this. And, and it can be something that they can, that can, becomes a living history. And so that's why it's not for sale. So, so the viewers will just have to imagine what, what, what it is. They'll have to imagine, or <laughs> they, can, they can write to the Kashukotine District Land Office in Fort Good Hope. Oh, okay. Or they can contact me and I can get a copy. Uh, we would like it to become a model for other First Nations communities. Mm -hmm. And I'm writing a manual right now so that it can be like a train the trainer so that other Indigenous communities can have their own heroes. They can have their um, Mohawk heroes or their Cree heroes or whatever, Natalnath, any, any kind of heroes that they want. Mm -hmm. If they like that idea, I can... Mm -hmm. happily show them how we did it. Oh, interesting. Well, that's fascinating. And then you have a few other books here to uh, Well, share. I brought some other books so that you could see what uh, traditional lifestyle is like up there. They, um, so these pictures um, take place in the past, but and it is like a historical account of the Danny people in Colville Lake and Fort Good Hope, so in the Satu. Um, so I try to, I, a lot of people are say, well, uh, how do people live a traditional lifestyle? This is how they live. They, they're trapping, they're hunting, they're making their own canoes. They are... Um, today? All of... Like, Not so much today. Okay, these yeah. are from these pictures are from 20, 30 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. But today there's a lot of they are going out on the land and they are um, still trapping, still hunting, still um, everyone fishes. That's you know, that's what you eat when you go visit. Mm -hmm. You eat dry fish in the summer. Um, the nets are out, you check your nets every day. In the winter, you check, you check your nets every day. 30 or 40 fish. After a while, you take the nets out because you've got too many fish. <laughs> and that's, and that, that is something, you know, the natural resources up there, they really do have amazing fish. And fish are being, in the oceans, are slowly going extinct all over the world. Mm. We've uh, fished out the oceans, but there's, there's lots of fish up in the, mm. in the Northwest Territories in those lakes. So, back to the heroes. Who are the heroes? A lot of the people wrote about a member of the family. Could mm. have been an uncle, a grandmother, grandfather. Um, we translated grandma and grandpa, which is Atho and Esse. Atho, yes. 
the, from into their language mm -hmm. because so many of the young people chose their grandma or their grandpa. Wow. Um, yeah. There's also, they have a prophet who is uh, in Delaney, from Delaney. There's four prophets, and uh, one student wrote about one of the prophets, mm -hmm. Prophet Eya, mm -hmm. and they wrote about the moms, um, uncles, grandmas, grandpas. Uh, some some of the students wrote about uh, a legend that they that they'd heard about, mm -hmm. that they and they admired the way that that person tackled a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's. that's very nice. Yeah, that's what they and so chose. volume two will be, um, will it be further heroes or will it? Yes. Okay. It's always going to be Dene Heroes of the Satu. Right. Volume two, pretty sure is going to be a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the people of the community said, we all want to write about our hero. We don't want to just, because I said, well, it should be the young people writing about their mm -hmm. heroes. And they said, why the young people? We want to write about our heroes. Sure. Even, you know, people in their 50s and 60s, they said, awesome. no, I, I have a hero too. And I said, well, why not? Why did I limit it in the first place? Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do now is to turn over responsibility to the community. This was their initiative in the first place. Mm -hmm. They just said, we need something. What would be a good project? I said, well, maybe they're Denny Heroes. And they said, okay, see what you can do. Now that it's been done, now that we have the book, I'm going to turn it back to them. I'm going to say, now, you can take responsibility for the cover picture, for who the, the contributions, mm -hmm. for putting it onto the computer, for compiling it. I'll just edit it and do a little bit, do maybe a little bit of book design. <laughs> so there it's going to be at least double the size. We also want to get more of the Denny language in there. It involves downloading the Denny font mm -hmm. to the computer and so on and then making sure that the publisher can can use those files, can read that their computer can read those files and so on. And it also means that each community will have a little bit different uh, story. But I think we can do it. And does the government uh, involve itself in this? or To date, no. No. But I think it's time to get some funding because it won't be sustainable without no. funding. And at the moment, we've had no funding. The band has just paid for the, all my expenses. But mm. I think as we, as we move forward, people will want to be paid for it, for their work that they do on it. And, the, and, and so they should be. So, um, and also as it grows and expands, I think that maybe different levels of government might want to be involved. So the territorial government, the federal government, we're hoping that they will pitch in some money so that we can, we can take this idea and take it across the nation. When's the last time you were in the community and when do you plan to be there? I was there in January yes. for the big celebration. Where the big each, celebration? Yes, where each of the contributors, oh. there's about 40 people who contributed okay. to the book. Each one got two books, one to mm -hmm. keep, one to share with someone they admire. And we had a feast, uh, we had drums, and we had a prayer, and uh, we had, it was, was wonderful. The whole community was in Fort Good Hope. And I'll be back in May, and in May I will be bringing the community and the teachers together. Uh, this will be a, another big first where they'll be actually collaborating on this, and I want them all to be part of the process for Volume 2, Denny Heroes. Wonderful. Well, Marianne, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. Heichkatsiem. This has been wonderful. <laughs> we say masi. Masi. Masi the cho. Oh, the masi, masi cho. cho. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank great. you, Zeb. Mm -hmm.